Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here in Australia. It's my second time here in the country. I'm pretty happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I will bring some news about Brazil. Hopefully, you can understand my accent. I will try to do my best here in English. Um, let's start. I would like to, now that you saw the picture, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but <laughs> actually, in Brazil, in the 80s, the Crocodile Dundee was a very famous movie in my country. I was a big fan. And my colleagues in Brazil, they know that. And last night, they just sent me the, this picture because they are so jealous I'm here, they are not, that they are trying to make some fun about me. But I decided to bring to you just to show how it feels. <laughs> I wish that thought was for real, but who knows? Maybe Saturday morning, I can go to see some crocodiles. <laughs> but anyway, let's go to the presentation. I will speak a little bit about some things that are happening in the world, the changing world that we are facing. You know I'm from Brazil, so two weeks ago I was there when all that scandal comes up. So I have a lot of news to explain what happened there, how is the situation right now, to try to understand how it, things can go going forward in the future. And of course, as a result of this changing world, this disruptive things, I will speak a little bit about the growing influence of Brazilian beef in the global market. And of course, we have a lot of challenges to deal in Brazil, but we also have a lot of opportunities that can become a very big um, amount of beef in the international market. And of course, what is our perspective of Australia in this global trade? So, just to get started, I would just like to talk a little bit about these things that are changing our world, the way that we are doing business nowadays. Some overnight things are changing the way that we look at numbers, we behave with our clients. For example, as you know, in Brazil, um, last Friday, actually two weeks ago, I woke up in the morning and I saw a lot of news about our industry. So overnight, we lost China, Hong Kong, um, part of the Europe, uh, Egypt, a lot of markets overnight. So 61% of our exports were closed. We lost overnight. So how to behave in this kind of situation? What Brazil did to overcome that thing? I will explain a little bit. After one week, after one week from this news, we had all the markets reopened. So now Brazil is able to export to all these markets again. So I, I will explain why, what happened, what really happened, and why, what Brazil did to be able to recover so fast from that big scandal. And of course, we also have other things happening in the world. So we have Trump, we have even influenza, for example, that is not from the beef sector, but it's just a way to see how things can change pretty fast. So all the world actually is facing challenges with even influenza. Hopefully, from my point of view, South America is not facing any challenge. So this is an advantage for our country to export because of this. So open new markets, open new opportunities. So in this landscape, what we expect from the future from a Brazilian perspective? So of course, the world is increasing the demand for meat. Not only beef, but also poultry, pork, and other kinds of animal protein. Different kinds of, of products different kind of producers. But mainly, we can say that the world will demand additional 10 million tons of beef in the coming 10 years. So just to give an example, Brazil, roughly speaking, is producing now 10 million tons. So it means that in the coming 10 years, the world will demand another Brazil in terms of beef to meet the demand. So there is a lot of space to different producers to meet that demand. But of course, the production actually doesn't take place exactly where is the consumption. So that's why you think that the trade, the international trade will increase. So from these 10 million tons, we expect that 2 million will need to be exported and imported over the seas, which means that the competition will increase, but there will be an additional volume available for all these producers. And a very important thing here, so we expect an additional 2 million tons, and only China and Hong Kong will be res responsible for 1 million. So half of this additional 
uh, volume that will be traded is from China and Hong Kong, which means that we need to take uh, an special look at these places. Of course, we have talked about China several times, but things are changing there. How things are changing there? We can see in this slide the imports, the beef imports from China since 2009 until last year. And you can see that in 2013, for example, Australia used to be the main supplier of beef to China. But Brazil regained access to China in 2015. And last year, Brazil became the, the main beef supplier to China. Several he reasons around that. Different products, we can say Brazil is just sending frozen beef to China. But this is a, a very interesting number to put in our hands to think a little bit about it. A very traditional market for Australia. In just one year that Brazil was there, Brazil became the first country in terms of beef supply to China. But of course, the appetite for globalization in trade has been tested lately. We know that we have some short-term impacts as a result of this, the, these challenges, such as the volatility in, in FX. We can mention here several countries that lost their purchase power by losing uh, the, their currency against the US dollar. This just as one example, some beef buyers that are now facing some challenges to, to have dollars to buy more meat. As a consequence, we have seen a decline in some imports, a short term. We have the TPP without the US that actually opens very, a big opportunity for countries such as Brazil that was out of this disagreement. So a lot of short term things. And we also have China and Mexico now looking for other alternatives. So a lot of things happening in this changing world. And as I said, Brazil overnight, this giant in terms of beef production, poultry production, coffee production, overnight lost more than half of, of its market. So we lost in just a few hours Hong Kong, Egypt, China, Europe Union, Chile, and Saudi Arabia. But let me explain a little bit about what happened in Brazil. We have in the country 4,800 processing plants in the country. But you need to consider that that number is beef, poultry, pork, fish, so all kinds of animal protein, right? So 4,800 processing plants. And after two years of investigation, the country is going on, uh, through a very long process of investigations against corruption. They found 21 units that actually could have some problems in terms of paying bribery for inspectors. But not because of the food quality. That's because of corruption, unfortunately. But hopefully my country is now addressing this problem, doing a lot of effort to overcome the situation. So we had the impeachment of our our former president last year. We have seen a lot of people on jail, which was not so common in my country. Very important people. And now the, the investigations arrived in the meat sector. So 21 plants. So after a big uh, movement from our authorities, we just had six processing plants with their license suspended. So six in a total of 4,800 because of bribery, not because of food safety. And as a result, this 0.2% of our capacity, we had all these problems. But hopefully, from my point of view, of course, the authorities in Brazil were able to respond pretty fast to this problem and explaining all the details for the Chinese president, for the Hong Kong president. So the Brazilian president just called in to explain what is, what is happening sending doc documents and so on. And as a result, after one week, all the main buyers are again importing from Brazil. So I think this is a case study because I would never believe that it could happen in my country when I was there last Friday, two, actually two weeks ago. And I just woke up with this break news. But hopefully the country was prepared to deal with the situation. So I just saw some preliminary numbers in Brazil and during the, the month of March, we had a decline, not considering today, of course, the last day of the month, around 11% of our exports against 
the same month of last year, which means that even considering all these scandals, all this media exposure, we had just 11% of decline in terms of volume against last year. And you expect that Brazil is, is still able to increase exports in the, in the whole year. So I think this is a very important information because I was in Brazil, I came with a lot of information, I was um, very uh, excited in terms of sharing that with all the, the audience here to, to really deliver the right message. So Brazil will continue to be a challenge in terms of exporting. Uh, I think this is a, something that we just, just need to put in mind. Just to show you the, the, how the market behave with this break news, we have, we have seen in Brazil cattle prices very, very stable over the last four years. So it's a very stable price. But after the news, you can see that we lost Europe, then we lost China, we lost Hong Kong, so prices start to decline. But after, they started to reopen the markets, so we have like a recover pretty fast. So this number is from yesterday. So we have back Europe, we have back China, we have back Hong Kong and so on. So now the future market, the futures market in Brazil is uh, very stable in levels that they was before the scandal. So actually things are quite back to normal in the country. So let's talk a little bit about Brazil to understand a little bit about this country. So here is our, uh, our kind of cattle in Brazil. It's a Nelori. It's very, very similar to Brahma. So uh, this is around 80% of our cattle in Brazil is Nelori. And the size of the herd in Brazil is huge. So we have in the country more than 2 million heads in terms of beef cattle, which means that a lot of potential to increase production. If you compare to other countries, Brazil has more than double the US, for example. But it's producing less beef than the US, having the double in terms of the herd size. So which means that productivity in the country is still very low if you compare to other countries. So this is our beef production projections for Brazil in the coming years. So we expect an increase around 300,000 tons of beef in Brazil in 2017. So which means that after uh, a time of rebuilding the, the, the herd in terms of the number of calves available in the field, we, you saw after two years of female retention, an increase around 300,000 tons. And we expect that over the coming 10 years, we're gonna see a, a, a pace of increasing around 3% per year in the country in terms of beef production. That's Brazil. I always like, I always, like to mention that the country still has 65% of native vegetation. Sometimes on TV we see Brazil just destroying the forest. Of course, there are some problems in the country, but we still have 65% of our native vegetation in place and is not allowed to cut a single tree without the government authorization. Some illegal things happen. We are trying to deal with that but we still believe that the country will be able to produce a lot of food without having to cut a single tree. And in terms of pasture, the country has 170 million hectares of pasture, and the, ox, the stock rate in Brazil is around one head per hectare. I will show some pictures here to, to, to explain why, but it's around one head per hectare in the country. As I told you, the beef prices in Brazil, actually cattle prices in Brazil, has been very stable over the last years. You can see here that since 2014, prices have, has been very, have been very stable. This is in Australian dollars, carcass price, so it's around $4 per kilo. But now that we are expecting uh, an additional supply in the country, and the domestic market is not able to absorb all this volume, probably we're gonna see a decline in these prices over the year. And this is important to mention. The economy in Brazil just had two years in terms of recession, declining around 4% per year in GDP, which was terrible. All as a result of that corruption things that I was mentioning. And as the country is trying to, to deal with the situation, uh, of course, there is a price, but I really believe that in the end of this process, the country will be stronger. But even though we had two years in the recession, 
we expect that now Brazil will be able to start increasing again. But the domestic market will still be quite weak during the year because the unemployment rate in Brazil is quite high now. It used to be around 7% on 2014, and is now around 13%, the unemployment rate. So the country is still struggling in terms of economy, and as a result, people are eating other kinds of animal protein instead of beef. But even so, after all this situation, the per capita consumption in Brazil is, on average, around 35 kilos of beef per year. So it is still a, a, a big cons internal consumption, around 200 million people, each one eating a lot, uh, around 35 kilos per year. So what it means is a big, big domestic market, and we are just exporting around 20% of our production. 80% of the production stays in Brazil. Just showing some figures on the Brazilian exports in 2016, we have seen a lot of increase in China. It is important to mention that Brazil regained action uh, access to China only in 2015. But so that's why we exported around 100,000 tons in 2015. In last year, it was around 165,000 tons. So then Brazil became the first, the main beef supplier to China. And other countries that we have exported, so Russia is a very important market as well. Hong Kong is a very important market. But Egypt, sorry, this is not in English. Egypt, the second one there, they declined a little bit last year because a lot because of the things that I was mentioning in the beginning, the changing world, so their currents actually were very, very uh, affected by the Trump's election. So they lost a lot of power, uh, purchase power in the international market. As a result, they started to buy less beef. So we had seen that. And the US, just to mention pretty fast about that, Brazil actually gained access to the US September last year for fresh meat. And in the first two months of this year, Brazil sent just 1.5 thousand tons to the US. So a very small volume. Brazil doesn't have any quota agreement with the US. So Brazil needs to compete uh, with other countries in a quota around 65 thousand tons. And we believe that probably Brazil will export only 10, 15 thousand tons this year to the US. But the thing is, Brazil is not trying to sell a lot to the US. The strategy was to get the US visa and our beef passport in order to have more bargain power to open other markets. So Brazil will now target Japan and South Korea. This is a very strong thing that the country will try to do in the coming years. Uh, we have seen a lot of talk between the governments. So before the scandal, we were expecting some news during this year. We don't know exactly now what things will go on, but probably in the coming one or two years, you can see some news about Brazil getting access to those markets as well. Uh, this is a very important mention. Last year I was here in Australia saying that Brazil was becoming very important in China and would get access to the US just one year ago. And at that time, it could sound quite strange. Are you sure Brazil will become a very important supplier to China? Brazil will gain access to the US? It's impossible, like a year ago, and happened. So. Now I'm here saying that Brazil will target Japan and South Korea. Hopefully I will be here next year telling, oh, the, oh in, in two years telling that the story is true. Let's see. So, but this year we have faced some challenges. Of course, this is before the scandal, as I mentioned, during March, Brazil declined preliminary numbers by 10% in volume in terms of beef exports. But in the two first months of the year, Brazil had already declined around 6% particularly because Egypt, because of that problem that I was mentioning in terms of currents. They bought a lot, a lot around 36,000 tons in the first two months of 2015, and only 11,000 tons this year, it, which means a decline around 25,000 tons in just one destination. So that's why we had this big decline. But also, Brazil is still increased to China. So if you compare to last year, China import more 65% from Brazil in the two first months of the year. 
which means that probably, even considering all these issues, Brazil will continue to be a main supplier of beef to that country. And of course, we have some challenges and some opportunities in Brazil, a lot of challenges. It's a developing country. We need to deal with a lot of issues in the country, so I will try to explain a little bit that. But before to, to, to talk about the bad news, I will talk about the opportunities. So I will spend some time talking about the feedlot in Brazil, what we have seen in the country, genetics, that is very important, and how the country is recovering its pasture lands, its underuse pasture lands. I have seen some very good pastures here in Australia, but I um, also have seen some other not so good. So I think it's the same thing in Brazil. We have several uh, producers uh, with very good pastures and others with uh, not so good quality. So the country have seen, has seen this kind of change, this improvement, which means a lot in terms of productivity that is still pretty low. So in terms of feedlot, we believe that the country, because of the grain availability that we have, Brazil is the largest soybean exporter in the world, is the second main corner producers, because Brazil actually has the second crop in the country because of the rainfall is quite uh, good. In the country, can have like 2.5 meters uh, rainfall per year, depending on the region you are. So in that region, you can easily plant soybeans during the summer. Then when we harvest the soybean, you can plant corn and harvest that during the winter, which is a big, big thing in terms of corn availability in the country. So as we have this corn availability in the country, the, we believe that Brazil will double the number of heads in feedlots over the coming decade. So we have, in 2015, around 4 million heads in feedlots in the country. Brazil is killing around 40 million heads per year. Our, so 10% is feedlot. And we expect that this number will reach 8 million heads in the coming 10 years. But why that decline in 2016? We have a big problem in terms of weather in the country last year. Exactly in the window when these producers were harvesting the soybeans and planting the corn. So the second season for corn was terrible. And as Brazil had a very competitive exchange rate in the first quarter of last year, Brazil exported a lot of corn expecting that the second season would be great, but because of this weather issue, we didn't have a good season. So local prices in terms of corn started to be very, very expensive. So producers prefer to keep their cattle on grass instead of sending to the feedlots. So that's why we saw that drop, that drop last year, but still, we still expect an increase over the coming years. And I brought some pictures here about the Brazilian cattle. So that is Nelori in the left part of the slide. And I put the Brahma in the right, just to show how similar they are. So it's a very similar cattle. In Brazil, we have around 70% of the cattle uh, just like that. But we also have in the south of the country some European breed, so mainly Angles and Hereford. But in the south in Brazil, it's quite good in terms of weather. The temperature is not so high. It's quite similar to New Zealand, I would say. But if you are in the center of the country, which is the main place to produce cattle, it's very hot, such as, as here. So during the, the summer, you can see 35, 40 degrees Celsius. So you cannot bring European breed cattle from the south to that part of the country without having problems uh, in terms of performance. But the country is doing what? It's cross-breeding the two kinds of cattle in order to have an animal that is strong against the heat, against the flies and so on, but also have a good performance. So that is the, the, the strategy that the country has approached. Cross-breeding in order to increase the number of heads in the feedlot, it's to have a better product to in some period of time to become a, a premium exporter. But nowadays, all the premium beef produced in Brazil keeps in the country. Actually, Brazil still needs to import some premium beef in order to, to, to meet the, the internal demand for this kind of product. So, but this is something that can change in the future. And this is the kind of underused pasture that I was mentioned. So this is in the state of Mato Grosso in Brazil. So this kind of land actually is disappearing 
in the country because the grain producers actually they are buying this land in order to produce grain or to recover pastures. So as a result of this work that the grain producers are doing in the country, after two years producing grains on this land, you can see a pasture like this. This is, is very common. We have now around 5 million hectares in the country working with integration between grains and livestock. And sometimes you can see also trees, as is the case of this, this picture here. So in this kind of property, you can have like two animals per hectare, which is a, a very big, big stock rate, rate in the country because of the rainfall and because of this work with this grain that put a lot of nutrients on the soil. And as a consequence, you can have after some years producing grains a very good pasture lands in that the same area. But now let's go to the challenges. So as you saw, uh, the Brazilian image in terms of food quality, beef quality is still very low. This is a, a research that the Brazilian uh, exporters did in 2015 to better understand how our clients were seeing Brazil in terms of beef quality, the perception of the consumers. So we put Brazil, India, the US, Australia, our neighbors, Uruguay and Argentina, to have an idea how Brazil is in terms of brand or worldwide. And you could see that Brazil still has a very low quality perception worldwide. So the country is trying to work hard on that, and things that happened two weeks ago doesn't help a lot. <laughs> Probably we're gonna have more work to do now than we had in the past. But the thing is, the country is trying to address this, this problem. And the first step was to open the US market. I think that was the strategy. Brazil was willing to open the US market in order to, to show that the country has um, food safety and food quality in a high level, which I believe we have, even considering that the, those last news that hopefully the country was able to, to explain to our buyers. And infrastructure, this is a big deal in Brazil. As I was mentioning, Brazil is the main exporter, globally speaking, of soybeans, of coffee, of poultry, of beef, of sugarcane, several commodities. As a result, we have a lot of competition in the port in order to export all these products. And we have a lot of rainfall in the country. So you can imagine, we have to build more roads, we have to build more ports to be able to, to do this in a competitive way. So now we can easily see in the state of Mato Grosso, when it rains, some roads just like that one. And depending on the season, you will find in the port a big line of trucks trying to export their products. So a lot of challenges to, to deal. So Brazil will not become a, a very big exporter of much more than it is now without having a lot of investments in infrastructure. So the country is still waiting for that. It's doing, but not in the, the, fast, the pace we, sh we should do. I think this is the, the main message of my presentation. So in terms of a changing world, I think the Brazilian case uh, is somehow a case of study for any other country to be prepared to face some challenges some, somehow. Social media, nowadays social media, is something that can spread a lot of news. Sometimes it's not the right information that are going worldwide. So I think that every country that is big producers, big exporters, should have like a plan in the case of dealing with this kind of situation. I think this is a case study for every country. And of course, increased volume and dependence on, on trade is something that we're gonna see in the coming 10 years. And I think that talking about the Brazilian role in the coming years in the, in the international market, as I mentioned, Brazil will continue to focus on China, on the Middle East, on Hong Kong, but also we'll try to open new markets in the future. I don't think that Brazil will have a huge presence in the US. I think this is not the strategy. I think Brazil will continue to try to open new opportunities in Asia for the coming years. And of course, as you saw, 
the productivity is increasing in the country. We have 200 million heads in the country. Productivity is increasing by doing crossbreeding, by improving pastures, by doing more feedlots. So we can see in the future probably Brazil increasing the amount of beef in the market without having to increase the herd. But as on, on the other hand, we have this, all these challenges. The country now is facing this whole things in terms of investigations, corruptions. That we, I think it's really good for the country. I think we are doing, we are going through a very serious process that probably you'll, be, you'll make the country stronger in the future. But now we are facing a lot of challenges. Our economy is still recovering. We have problems with infrastructure, a lot of things. So guys, I think that's, that's it for, for the presentation today. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope I had some useful information for you in this presentation. I will be with you for the whole day. If you have any questions, we can grab a coffee together. Thank you very much.